Hello, I'm Veronica Jaguer, and you're about to hear the first chapter of The War Hymn of the Old Gods, a new novel by Edward Clark. It is the sequel to The Ballad of Iron Percy, a Parsec finalist podcast novel that is currently available for free download from patiobooks.com and iTunes. If you enjoy this work, consider donating to this Indiegogo crowdfunding project for a number of great rewards, including a download of the written script and early access to the full audiobook. You're listening to The War Hymn of the Old Gods, written by Edward Clark, read by Veronica Jaguer. Chapter 1 as I put pen to page now, I do so as a freed being once more. There. I have said it. I have hesitated to voice the thought since my saviour, your son and heir, Graham Wilmore, arrived at the cell door. It would have seemed premature otherwise. My Graham had no real plan, only good intentions and a promise to act toward my liberty— I had no reason to expect that he would be successful. In truth, I had every reason to believe that we would fail to slip away. I was locked in the most secure cell of the castle at Port Gareth, held high in its tallest tower, imprisoned within a fortress on a hill patrolled by hundreds of garrisoned soldiers. I was weakened by starvation and captivity. I had but two allies to depend upon— and I did not know that I could count on their support until the last possible moment. Graham was one. You, of course, were the other. The Lord Wilmore, master of all Halens in this land, or so I was told. Your mastery of them was not so complete that you could avoid their ire and judgment in the end. Ah, uh, but— how could you have predicted such carnage, my master? The vilest Cadi had a greater cunning than any one knew, and they demonstrated this when they murdered your fire brigade and set your wooden capital ablaze. It was something of a miracle that your boy and I were able to leave that furnace with our lives. Luck was but one element in our escape. The very reason we managed to slip away in the first place. Were it not for the unpredictable chaos of that bloody night, when the crown jewels of Ducata burned, we would have surely perished in the attempt. If we had not met Captain Aranound and her crew when we did, we would not have survived an encounter with the Escati berserkers that brought anarchy to Port Gareth that evening. That she agreed to take your son aboard her vessel— saved the both of us. I can wish and pretend that it was our skill, our desperate survival instinct that accounted for the escape, but that would not be the truth. Fortune smiled on us. If it had not, we would have found our deaths in the streets of the city as it turned to cinders around us. But there is another reason I yet live— and it is one that I hesitate to confront. I am only able to write this letter of thanks now because of your sacrifice, my Lord Wilmore. I must choose to be honest if I am to understand. You traded your own life for mine, and you risked the air you loved in the process. I find it impossible to follow the reasoning behind your decision. I knew you were an intelligent man, yes. This does not strike me as an intelligent decision. Thinking on it tilts my head and curls my tail. Why, my lord? Why would you do such a thing for one of your captives? You were not so repulsed by me as your counterpart, the curate. This brought me some hope, yet I did not become the focus of your fantasies either. Despite my every attempt, you never stared upon me with lust. You earned my grudging respect with such profound control over your own desires, though I felt sure that this show of self-mastery would mean my end. 
why would you have spared me if not to bed me? I thought I was doomed. It is obvious that my fears never became a reality. That you came to believe my story is no real surprise to me. You sought the truth, and I have told it. Now that I am free and have nothing to lose by my honesty and nothing to gain by deception, I will continue to support my version of events. I spoke only the truth in my account. I do not know how you managed to determine this. Even I knew that my story was a strange one, and that it was not likely to be accepted as fact. But I am, of course, grateful. This still does not explain your decision to make your fatal trade. When I think on this vexatious problem, it is this part that I cannot fully grasp, that you believed me and that I did not deserve to be killed for my minor crimes according to your Halen laws, does not explain your willingness to give your own life to prevent a so-called injustice. As I have said, I know that your mind is keen. I do not believe that you made your choice blind to the possible consequences. No. I think you knew that you would face the gallows when you made the choice to support me. If I assume that this is the truth, that you acted with full knowledge of what might happen, did you regret your choice in the end, when you danced on the end of a rope to the tune of ugly cheers from the people you served? I suppose the question is irrelevant. After certain choices, there can be no changed minds or reconsiderations. At least, it cannot be said that you did not pick your own path. But I must confess, my Lord Wilmore, it is not a choice I would have made. I think about what you have done for me, and I experience a wild flurry of emotions. Gratitude, wonder, confusion, and shame are chief among them. It saddens me to think that were our situations reversed, I would not have made the same sacrifice for you. Why, my master? Did you not value your life as I value mine? Did you truly believe the Vale's story of everlasting life after death, even after your damnation at the hands of your hot-headed colleague? Perhaps it is none of these things, and you offered your life simply because that is what the other goddess you worshipped, the Lady Justice, demanded of you. These are questions that I would pose to you, if you could answer them. Each breath I draw from now on, I draw by your leave. You did not simply spare my life. You saved it. I find this thought to be sobering. I live because you decided that I should. You are still my master because of this, such an uncomfortable revelation. I cannot repay you in kind now. I know, too, that is not a debt you could ever come to collect from me. It should come as no surprise to you that I do not subscribe to the Halen view that the human consciousness survives death. You and I will never speak again. You will never read these missives, and writing them is wasted effort. But you have given me something most precious to you. You have given me your son. He is the last of your legacy. In your damnation and in your execution, you squandered your name. I have been led to understand that your title will mean little to those who were once your peers, my master. Your estate, the men once loyal to you. The handsome scribe can count on none of these things. Your choice has altered his destiny forever. It is a cruel world, one likely to become ever harsher in the coming months. My Elise would have me believe that the entire political structure of New Jakarta has been severely damaged by this Ascati victory, 
and that it is impossible to predict what strange local government will emerge now, or what Great Hale's response to the violence will be. It is this world that Graham enters now, and he is not prepared for it. If I am to believe the hushed whispers aboard the scar of a garrisette, nobody is. But in such conditions there is opportunity. I know that you were grooming your son to one day become a great man, yes? Great men are not made by patient instruction, my Lord Wilmore, though I suppose that can help. Great men are made by confronting challenges and overcoming them, by standing tall in the face of adversity and surviving life's attempts to end them. Your own destiny was forged when you took to the ramparts and stood your ground against those who sought to end your life twenty years ago. You were forced to take your measure as a man, and you liked what you found. Graham is on a similar path, my master. There will be many obstacles in his future, and his destiny is far from certain. As I said, there is opportunity here for him, the opportunity to grow into his father's shoes and take control of his own future. He will have to search for his own strength, as you did. Indeed, he has already begun to do so. I can see it on him, and though his features are twisted with grief for you now, he walks with a growing confidence in himself that makes him appetizing to my eyes. But do not fear, my Lord Wilmore. I will keep myself from indulging that particular curiosity about him for as long as I am able. Though it would be easy to bed him and get the full measure of him myself, and though I am greatly tempted by the thought of doing so, I will not. You see, there is opportunity here for me, too, the chance to settle the debt between us. I hope you will not be offended when I tell you that I am determined not to be bound by it forever. I will see to your son's safekeeping. He will survive the end of Port Gareth, and I will help him to pick a new path, one that allows him to grow into his destiny as you intended. I will see to it that he lives through this disaster, and I will make sure that he has all he needs in order to flourish. Yes, that will suffice. I have enjoyed our one-sided conversation, my master. I believe I will write to you again, until it no longer pleases me to do so.